God bless you, Get Woke. Folks, MIP is now COVID free, meaning free to all subscribers as we navigate this pandemic. We're thinking about everyone and we've got to get through this together. So for a limited time, no fee to subscribe to make it plain on your favorite podcast app. very special guest joining us on Make It Plain today. She is a graduate of Florida Memorial University. She's worked in Miami-Dade County government for over 20 years, a Miami Gardens native, a lifelong resident a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and the National Council of Negro Women. Those are some things you may not know about her, but you should. Unfortunately and tragically, most of us know her for another reason. And that is because of the death of her 17-year-old son, Trayvon Martin. She founded the Trayvon Martin Foundation, but she's not stopped. She not only has been such an influence and such a, a spirit for other grieving mothers. She's mentored young people. She's become a leading voice on the need to end senseless gun violence. She founded the Trayvon Martin Foundation, but she's also doing even more now. She's decided to run for office and her campaign is in full swing elections in August. We wanna hear all about it from our dear queen mother, Sabrina Fult. Sabrina, how are you? God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm doing well. I can I can absolutely say that I'm doing well. I'm I'm in a, you know, I'm in my right state of mind. You know, I'm healthy. You know, I got shelter over my head, a few dollars in my pocket. I have food in the refrigerator. You know, my air condition is working. I mean, I can't ask for much more. I'm coronavirus free, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I can't ask for much more. Well, you know, by, by the way, let me ask you something, because I know your, your governor is crazy. And some of these folk are out and about on beaches and stuff. What's the, what's the situation uh, in Florida, particularly in your area? Are, are people around you still sheltering at home and, and staying in? Or, or what, are folks still trying to get outside? Well, for the most part, people are still staying in, even though um, this week they've started opening up things. They did, they step one and opening up a lot of things. But for the most part, I think people are staying in. I mean, when I, instead of going to a restaurant, I kind of order my things and then I just go to the restaurant and pick them up, you okay. know, and then I come back. I mean, it's not that many places I go. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm still sheltering at home. I'm still practicing the six feet. Um, every time I go out, and it's more than just me, I wear a mask. And so you still have people that are conscious, that are responsible and are still doing that. But then you still have a lot of people that don't believe the virus is real, don't believe that they can catch it, don't believe that they can die from it. And so they're not practicing, uh, uh, you know, six feet you know, social distancing, they're not, they're not wearing their masks unless it's required. You know, they're doing things like really carelessly. Um, and you got to let those people be themselves, mm. you know, um, j just as long as, you know, I know me and in my house, you know, we're, we're wearing masks, we're wearing gloves, you know, when we go out and we, you know, in the store. I mean, it's, I, I'm still just going to Walmart and Target. Those are the only two places yeah. I really go, you know, a gas station every now and then, but I'm I'm not, you know, in the restaurants. I'm not at the beach. I'm not doing those things. I exercise, you know, at least three days a week also. I, I know you said you were thankful for your air conditioning. Is it hot already down there? Oh, yes. Summer started two months ago. Really? Yes. Wow. Okay. Yes. I'm sure we in the 80s right now. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so being at home, how about the camp? How is that affecting your ability to get out and campaign? 
Well, it kind of slowed us down for maybe uh, about two two months. It slowed us down. Um, I, I didn't really feel comfortable trying to raise money during that time. And you know, campaigning is about raising money. And so I didn't feel comfortable. I thought people were more concerned with, with you know, making sure that they were safe, making sure that they uh, were preventing, taking preventive preventive measures as it relates to the virus. I, I just felt like people was in another state of mind. They wasn't thinking about campaigning. And so um, we took about two months off and then we really just got started back again. And, and we in full st stream, like right now we in full stream. We are, you know, making our calls. Okay. Um, we, we're, you know, we haven't knocked on any doors yet. We are doing door hangers. Um, we're putting up signs, a lot of yard signs, a lot of signs on the corners and things like that. And so I'm just talking to, still talking to the people that I know to make sure that they know that I'm running. Um, my friends and family, you always start with your friends and family. And then um, we, we have call lists. I have a call list and I call those people and just kind of introduce myself. You know, one of the things I really admire about you is your humility. You don't know, and I'm sure you've seen this too, how many calls I get from people. Mark, I want to run for senator. I'm like, mm, I don't know if you're quite ready for that. You know, a lot of folks want to start at the top. <laughs> right. And, and you chose, because I mean, these local elections down ballot sometimes are just as important, if not more important, because ultimately all politics is local. And there are decisions that are made on a local level that need to be, you know, looked into. And, and you've been with the government. Well, first of all, you said, and I wasn't aware, you worked for the government, for, for the Miami-Dade County government for over 20 years, right? Yes, I worked, doing in, what? I worked in five different departments for Miami-Dade County. So not only am I a lifelong resident, um, I've also been an employee for over 20 years. Right. So um, being an employee, I've got an opportunity of working within Miami-Dade County, the same entity that I'm running for the seat for. A lot of people don't, um, they, they don't connect those dots. They like, okay, she had a job but they don't know that the, the actual employment that I have was service oriented and it worked, I worked for the residents. And so I'm just simply giving this seat back to the residents. Good. Even though I might be sitting in the seat, I'm the candidate and I'm the person who is gonna get Miami-Dade County Commissioner uh, District 1. I'll be sitting there, but I'll be absolutely uh, a spokesperson for the residents. Yeah, no, that that's great. So this is the Board of Supervisors, is that the, it, no, it's, a, it's the county, board of Miami-Dade County Commissioners. I'm sorry, yes, the County Commissioners. So uh, tell us about that entity and, and what actually it does. What would you be handling uh, as you were giving the seat back to the residents? Um, and I'm going to put it in my own terms. Please. Um, not only will I be reviewing and analyzing and giving my opinions and voting on ordinances, ordinances here in um, Miami-Dade County, but also uh, about the residents, about uh, um, what's good for the residents, what's beneficial for the residents. And um, I do a very good job with listening to the residents. So I've gone to a few community meetings and everything, and what I do is I listen to the residents, as opposed to telling them what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it and all of these things, but that would be self-serving. That would be for me. So I, I just listen to the residents and what their concerns are and what their needs are. And that's, that's what I'm a spokesperson for those residents. And so it's a matter of just, uh, uh, connecting with the residents and bringing the information back to the board of County commissioners and, and, um, you know, deciding on what's best for the residents and how they can, uh, continue to live in a decent and safe environment. Um, we have a lot of problem with crime down here as anybody else, but um, it's more abundant down here in Miami-Dade County. I mean, um, you, you have people now who have, have been lifelong residents and they're afraid, you know, they're afraid to go to like, you know, the, the stores and the gas stations and things like that, because so many people are robbing and stealing, you know, stealing their things. They're breaking into homes, they're breaking into cars. And so, um, I want to bring that security back to the residents. I want them to feel safe and secure. 
Um, I want to make sure I connect them with the police department, connect the residents with the police department so I can make sure that we are moving forward instead of continue to have deaths, continue to have shootouts and, you know, retaliation is going on here as well. I just want to make sure that those things happen. I also want to take a look at the, uh, like the traffic congestion that's here, transportation that's here, um, as far as the, uh, metro bus metro move on things like that i want to make sure people are are um getting good better jobs like maybe they need more training and maybe they need to have a uh, um some type of uh, classes in order for them to get better jobs here i mean you can get a job you know at, at the stadium here you can get a job at a department store here but those jobs are not gonna you know allow you to stay in this community. So maybe they need additional training and things like that. So I want to bring those things to the table. Um, no, that's that's good. And I, and I know that's valuable. I'm just curious, is, is crime still as rampant right now during this pandemic? Well, it kind of went down and, okay. and we didn't hear anything about it until somebody like started saying something. Somebody gave some statistic and said, oh, well, we haven't had a shooting in 30 days. And as soon as they said that, we had a shooting. Oh no. You no. Know? So uh, we, we, I think that was the first time that we had gone for like 30 days and nobody had been shot and killed. I mean, it, people are being robbed every day. But as far as shooting, I think people kind of calmed down for a little while, but then it, it was brought to somebody's attention and, and, and it, it, it just started back again. You also mentioned jobs and skills training. Uh, I was talking with a member of the Senate just this week about how Sabrina, as a result of this pandemic, a whole lot of folk who've lost jobs are going to have to be retrained. So, so that idea is absolutely urgent and necessary right now. Right. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in doing is just making sure people are employed right now. Okay. Like right now, it's 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 devastating to think about how many people that's out of work and how many people um, are laid off, fired, furloughed, or whatever it may be. It, it's just devastating to think about those things. So first of all, we gotta get them back working, and once we get them back working, then the next step is for them to do additional training. But I just want people to have checks in their pockets so they can feed their family and have a roof yeah. over their heads. People are really thinking about that now. Yeah. So does a, does a county commissioner, do you represent, if you're elected, would you represent a, a part of the county or are these at large commissioners, all of them? No, they're definitely a, um, a part of Miami-Dade County. Um, there are 13 dif different districts. And I think right now it's about six people that are running for office um, for um, commissioner. Um in different districts. So there are 13 throughout Miami-Dade County from one county, to the Miami-Dade County is in between two counties. So uh, the 13 make up the, the 13 districts in between those two counties. And so okay. we kind of start from Broward County and we go all the way down South. But yes, it's a portion of Miami-Dade County. Do, do you have any opposition? Yes, I got one person that's running against me. Okay, okay. So how many, and, and, and I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm, I know I'm doing this interview, but I'm also putting on my political organizer's hat. So, so how many people, do you know the number of residents in the di districts you're running in? How many? It's roughly about 140,000 people in the district. I okay. only need about 12,000 votes in order to win. Okay. Um, okay. Even though this is a pre predominantly African-American district, a lot of people don't get out and vote. So um, what I'm trying to encourage people to do is get out and vote. Like it's, it's so important. Um, I want to get them ready for our November election. That's right. Yeah. So uh, this election is in August. And so I, I want to get the, the young people who probably have never voted before. You know, we got a group of people, um, the super voters that always vote for every election. But then there are some people that vote every now and then. I want to get the people that vote every now and then and also the ones that never vote they like okay we don't have time i want to encourage them to to get out and vote it's important and um i just want to um for me um this is just another level of what i've been doing um 
you know, working for Miami-Dade County, working on behalf of residents, um, doing a lot of training, um, just listening to residents with associations, homeowners associations, and different things like that. Because my last tenure with uh, Miami-Dade County was with the housing agency. So I dealt with low income and no income residents. And so it's just a matter of explaining things to them. I got them, I went from having zero people involved to having standing room only in the meetings. And so I got people interested in where they were living and that was important. And so I just have to find a niche with residents to find out what's important to you and whatever is important to people, they, they mainly want to see it improved whether it's the road, whether it's construction, whether it's the new development, whether it's employment, whether it's crime, whatever it is, um, what, whatever is important to them, I want to work on that. I don't want to have my own agenda. I don't want to listen to other people outside my district. I want to listen to my district. I want to work for my residents, and I want to make sure that they feel safe and secure in their own community. Yeah. And you know, they feel like they have a spokesperson. Uh, well, well, clearly they do. And obviously, because of the work you've already done with residents, I, frankly, Sabrina, I, I see people remembering that. I mean, you've already been involved in organizing residents. I'm sure they respect that. How do you, are you finding people getting inspired and excited about your campaign? Are you getting some good responses? Well, I have a lot of people because um, they uh, they remember Trayvon. And so when they see me, they, they're like, oh, you're Trayvon Martin's mom. And I say, yes, I am. But let me tell you what else I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. And so I have to tell them about what I'm doing. So it's I'm, I'm moving from one box to another box. I'm going to always be uh, Trayvon Martin and Javaris Fulton's mom, always. That'll never change. But now I'm, I'm kind of moving to my next chapter. And my next chapter is campaigning, running for office, being a candidate for Miami-Dade County District 1. And so I'm really excited about it. And I'm excited about what I could bring to the table. I'm, I'm excited about um, just a pair of new eyes looking at things in a different way. Um, I just feel like it's a new day here in Miami-Dade County. But I'm also thinking about the people who know you as Trayvon Martin's mom and the people you helped when you worked in government. You know, so those folk really get a full picture of who you've always been. You were just talk, talking about, you know, the things you did for people in housing. And I bet a lot of people remember that, know that, and, and have spread that word too. Oh yeah, absolutely. I used to do hearings. I used to be the hearing officer for, for, for Miami-Dade County for Section 8 and public housing. Mm -hmm. So they definitely know me from um, doing hearings. I was always fair. I always um, provided, you know, um, a good decision making and good judgment. And if it was things that they needed to know, I made sure they had the information, you know, because a lot of times we assume um, people have read this paperwork and read this and maybe they haven't. And so um, I, I, I was very thorough when it came to uh, um, being a hearing officer. Um, I also worked on a program called Family Self-Sufficiency. That's when you prepare people to move out of public housing in Section 8, which some people don't want to do. But, you know, I did encourage some people to do that, and they were able to move out um, through job training, like I said before, through job training, you know, and just giving them a different perspective of just life and yeah. their life. Yeah. Um, and then um, I work with um, the resident associations, resident councils, and those are like the HOAs of public housing. It's like a homeowners association committee of public housing. I work with them. I did a lot of training for them and, um, you know, just moved them just a little bit forward from where they were just to, for them to learn a little bit, bit more about um, how they can help the residents and that allowed them to help me. Yeah, no, no, that's that's a that's a beautiful thing. And and the county would be blessed, of course, to have you in that role. I mean, if if and if and if you can inspire more people to come out and vote, sounds like it's yours. I mean, because it sounds like if people would just turn out and come out and vote and not um, uh, minimize it. I, I like what you said, too, about November, especially in your state. Lord have mercy. We need people. <laughs> <laughs> we need people to vote. I mean, your state is critical, so you're playing an important role. Um, you've got Hillary Clinton. Lord have mercy, doing fundraisers for you. Look at you. 
<laughs> I don't see nobody else doing Hillary Clinton fundraisers. Look at you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always honored. I mean, uh, I went to her book signing. I mean, even after um, she ran for, you know, president um, in 2016, um, you know, we campaigned for her, the Mothers of the Movement. Right. Uh, we traveled so many places. We were in the Secret Service motorcade. I mean, it's just, I learned so much just listening to her and, and, and just seeing how resilient she was, how passionate she was about helping other people. And it has something to do with me running for office. And so I want to say personally, I want to thank her um, when I'm on the call with her. And um, she knows it. Um, I, told, I tell her all the time, a lot of people don't know the real Hillary. I mean, she's just really, really a down to earth person and just somebody that you just need to connect with. And so um, when I decided that I was going to run for office, um, I actually decided um, in New York at Reverend Sharpton's um, National Action Network. Right. That's I remember. <laughs> um, so Rev had a lot to do with it too. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I, uh, I gave her a call and she was so excited about it and everything. And so, of course, with, um, you know, me running for a, uh, commissioner uh she wants to you know just help out and do what she can so we'll be on a call this friday folks at, at friday um uh, friday, at ruth, three friday three o'clock uh with ruth ruth list florida is also a part of this yes how, how can people who would listen if they want to get on is there a way for them to to get on to the call and and listen and make a donation Absolutely. They should go on my website. It's sabrinafulton.com or right. they can go to any one of my social media pages. You'll see the uh, a picture of Hillary and I and, and just click on that link. Right, right. Um, so you two have kept in touch. Absolutely. Yeah. She actually kept in touch with most of the moms. But, um, but you know, but, but that's the thing, you know, I know you said she's an inspiration to you, but there is no way you have not been an inspiration to her. And I know that for a fact, because what you've been through, you know, I, I, I even get emotional whenever I talk to you because most of us don't know where we would have the strength to do what you do and, and be who you are. And so, um, I mean, how, how she's a mother and a grandmother. I'm sure she gets as much or more inspiration from you uh, as you get from her. Uh, I always ask you because because I know it, it's it's it, you'll never not have to deal with it. Um, but how much of that experience inspires you now in your run for office, and does the the drive to run even sometimes help deal with? the the emotion and pain that you may still feel in other words can can you fill up some of the loss by doing what you're doing now by running and giving back and trying to make a difference i, I think it does i think it absolutely does you know I, i'm not asking people for sympathy votes i'm just asking them to vote for me just because you want to see a change in your community um you've seen everybody that pretty much is in politics and what they're going to do but you have not seen this new day this this new beginning you have not seen a fresh new eyes and so a lot of times here um people who are in politics they continue to run and so they become career politicians but then they are part of the same machine that's the problem and so i just believe that i bring to the table just a new set of eyes just a fresh new ideas and things like that um, I can say that it helps me emotional because um, I have to stay busy. And, and so um, I, I can tell you from 2012, I have literally been busy like every month. Mm -hmm. I have not had like, I might take like a weekend off, mm -hmm. but I'm still on the phone. I'm still emailing. I have not just had the time to just take time out. And, and that's what happened. Um, I guess the the mid mid March when the virus first like really was active, um, I was at home. I was relaxing. 
but I wasn't stressed. I prayed and I, I meditated and I read my Bible and I watched movies and I cooked and I, uh, I, I exercised around the house. I would sit on the porch. I mean, I did all of those things, but it was, it gave me an opportunity just to reevaluate re everything in my life and just press the restart button and just start all over. And so that's what I've done. I mean, I, I feel like I'm refreshed. I feel like I'm re rejuvenated. Um, I'm ready to travel again. I speak with a speakers bureau um, out of Boston. And so I'm ready for them to give me some more speaking engagements. I'm ready to continue the campaign. I'm ready to, um, I've connected with my circle of mothers the weekend after Mother's Day. Um, it's about mothers who lost um, children to senseless gun violence. Um, I'm still running the Trayvon Martin Foundation, so I'm keeping myself like busy, 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 busy. Yeah. But I do take time out for myself as well. But you know, but it's also clear to me, e even if you had not had that tragedy thrust upon you, your experience and your articulation, even today, of what's needed in that county qualifies you to run. So no, there's, it's not a sympathy vote at all. You qualified to be a commissioner and you've worked with the community you've done all of that so i mean this this is something that may have been ordained for you no matter what i have to ask you this though because we're still dealing with stuff and so we're just seeing now the video and reacting to what happened in minnesota with george floyd uh and and another i can't breathe situation right um obviously you will always have the memory of what happened to Trayvon with you, but but what does it do to you when you see what happened to Trayvon repeated, Sabrina? Um, I can remember maybe a few weeks ago, the early part of May, um, I was being contacted by a lot of media outlets. They wanted to get a statement from me. They wanted a comment. They wanted an interview. I mean, I had so many calls coming in. It, it made me think I was back in 2012, 2013. Like I had just that many calls coming in. But um, what people um, understand is that I wasn't in a position at that time to talk about it. it. It hurts too bad on some of these cases that I can't even talk about it at the time. So I waited almost a week before I started commenting and before I had anything to say about it. I just couldn't. I just it just bothered me so much um to know that people are so comfortable and I use that word deliberately they're comfortable with killing African Americans and not being held accountable for it. We we have gotten into a society that is comfortable with shooting and killing us. And, 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 and not being arrested, not going to jail, not being convicted, nothing happens. You go home, you sleep in your bed with the weapon that you just killed somebody with. That, that should disturb a lot of people and not just African-Americans. Yeah. That, that's the issue that I have. Yeah. As an African-American, of course, we're going to be disturbed because it's us. But it should make other people feel uncomfortable as well. They should say to themselves, why does this keep happening to African-Americans? They're looking at videos now. They're seeing the videos for themselves. How could you not? How could you not want to get involved? How could you not want to participate? How could you not want to speak up when you see things like that that happen? So we got to start holding a lot more people accountable. Yeah. And not just the ones that's involved. We got to get those uh, 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 district attorneys. We got to get the police chiefs and the police officers that were on that scene as well. We got to make sure that we're holding all of those people accountable. Yes, ma'am. And a lot of people get upset because we do. We we have this. We're doing what we have to do. We making noise because we have to make noise. We protest because we have to protest. If they were doing exactly what they needed to do, we wouldn't have to protest. We wouldn't have to unite and come together and do all of these things. We wouldn't have to make calls and sign petitions and do all these things. We're doing these things because we have to. Mm. Because if we don't do it, then that person's death is in vain. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Sabrina. Um, 
folks, I'm excited about this campaign. I wish I could be there. If some, if this weather opens up, I may even come down and campaign for you. Thank you. Uh, and help you out. Uh, excited about this Friday, the 29th. Uh, go to sabrinafold.com and you can be a part of the fundraiser that uh, Hillary Clinton is going to be a part of for Sabrina Folk. And Sabrina deserves it. I know that's going to be wonderful. She's going to be uh, fighting folks in Miami-Dade for the residents, for transportation, for uh, economic opportunities, for, for housing affordability, you know, um, and, and that's needed. And she's qualified, y'all. Uh, you've heard it. She, she basically said it and made it very, very clear. We wish you all the luck in the world. We will talk, talk again. I'm going to encourage people to go to your website and to give every chance I get. And like I said, if I can figure out a way to get down there, once some of this pandemic, I'm still up here in the epicenter in New York, so I'm hiding out from it. <laughs> but uh, as soon as we can, we'd love to come down there and be a part of the campaign. This is, this is really wonderful. I'm very happy for you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate the support. I got a lot of love behind it. Um, I just talked to Lucy McBeth, who uh, yeah. is a congressperson and a congresswoman in uh, Atlanta. Um, I just talked to her this morning because I, I just had to keep my head right a lot of times. And what, what I'm going through now, she's been through. And yeah. so I listen to, I lean on her for advice and different things. And so we have to chit chat about stuff too as well. So that was uh, Jordan Davis's mom. Of course, of course. And, and I know Jordan was with her throughout her process. And I know Trayvon's with you. You know, we, 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 we carry our loved ones with us who passed away. And, and we I tell people that place. all the time. I say not even the death of my son will, will separate me from the love of my son. That's something that people don't understand unless you lost a child. Like, I didn't stop loving him when he died. I still love him. I will love him forever. Yeah. And so I, I, I say that to people who I know have kids like you, because that's my nephew. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I met him early on and he's always been in my heart, you know. Um, you know that. <laughs> but um I, he does I, too. We love you for that because you you adopted my son and I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Um and congratulations on his graduation too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. But I'm doing well, and I, I thank you for inviting me on. I thank you for your support, your continued support. Um I think the last time I seen you was at the uh Women's March in D.C. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, you, I know you're doing well. You're an inspiration to us all. Your, your strength, your resilience, your, your, your effervescence, and even having the energy to campaign. Something I share with you in, in ministry, you know, you talked about you, you never separated from the love of Trayvon. You know, we, there's a scripture where we say we're never separated from the love of God. And... That's true with Trayvon and our other loved ones who go on to be with God. Absolutely. And even those who don't go, because we are God, many of us in person, if we're living the right kind of life and trying to emulate God. So that's true. We, we can't be separated. And even though I never met Trayvon, you know, I, I think about him, you know, and, and I think about what happened and, and how that might affect you. and, and just so many others, it, 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 it's, it's overwhelming that these things continue to happen. And it's bad enough we got a pandemic and folks still shooting and killing us and putting chokeholds on us. We, we dying enough disproportionately from the pandemic. But it's like, no, y'all, we need this to happen even more to y'all in this way. And so, you know, we and just it's, have- it's so, it's so out front and so, you know, just so deliberate, just so, you know, they knew that they were being recorded, but it didn't matter. Didn't care. Didn't care. So, so they're comfortable with what they were doing. SabrinaFulton.com, folks, uh, we love you. Uh, you all support Sabrina Fulton wherever you are. Send her some money, even small dollar donations. Um, and, and, I was, and, I, and I appreciate you, too, and, and your call. Not the one that, you know, asked for money in the middle of this pandemic. That's that's very see that's what a person with compassion does. But now that we're coming out of this, you can send her five, ten dollars, whatever. And if a bunch of people do that, then that's some money. And then Hillary Clinton will be with her on Friday, March 29th at three o'clock. Uh, go to SabrinaFold.com so you can participate. But um 
you're amazing. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna think, I, I think I'm free. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to pop in on Friday, too. Okay. All okay. right. SabrinaFulton.com, ladies and Thank you so much again, all right? Thank you. Take care, okay? All right. It was wonderful. Love you. Love you, too. Ladies and gentlemen, as usual, here on Thursdays, we have a segment called Thursday Coast, named after Marcos and Daily Coast, the largest online progressive community. Today, Marcos is not with us, but in his place is someone very important we need to at least touch base with. She is the campaign's director for DailyCoast.com, doing great, great work. But she also happens to live in extremely close proximity to the site where George Floyd was killed by police. So the campaign's director from DailyCoast.com joins us now from Minneapolis. Erna Landrum is with us. Erna, God bless you. Welcome to Make It Plain. Uh, wow, how are you? All of us are feeling what has happened, but you are right there. I, I'm pretty close. Um, George Floyd was murdered at Cup Foods, which is a corner store about four blocks away from my home. And I mean, right now, I just feel, I feel a lot of things. I feel really angry. I feel very sad. I feel... Um, you know, just in the midst of a pandemic where people, lots of us are making the choice to not go out into the large protests because, um, because we're minding our health. Um, so I feel a little less, I feel a little less connected to people than I usually am in circumstances like this when we're just all together and, and fighting for justice together. Yeah, yeah, and that is a concern. Come, and myself, someone who's always out in the streets protesting. I mean, this is the, the one moment I I normally I'd have been on next flight to Minneapolis to stand with all of you. Yeah. So um you're you say you're about 4 blocks away? Yes. Um tell us a, a little bit about that area um where Cup Foods is. So that area uh on the the intersection of Chicago and 38th is a historically black community in South Minneapolis. Um, it's very near Powderhorn Park. Uh, it's sort of at the intersection of a few Minneapolis neighborhoods. And it's also one that's seen a lot of changes uh, in recent years. At that intersection, you know, there are people who are looking at a lot of changes and the ways that it's being gentrified. And, um, you know, and just like really thinking about how we as a community defend the neighborhoods so that those folks who have historically been the backbone of the community get to live and thrive there. Um, and it's also, it's also an area where folks are heavily policed, right? Um, where, <sighs> yeah, that's it, where, where folks are heavily policed, where um, there, it feels like uh, there's just a watchful eye over the people who've, who've historically made up that neighborhood. Yeah. And so being that close, I mean, even though you're not going outside, I guess you can can hear and and feel some of the protests that are taking place out there right now, can't you? Well, so yesterday, uh, the big the big protest yesterday, actually, uh, the, the main street that Cup Foods is on was taken over by the protest. And so vehicle traffic uh, diverted right on my block. And so I was sitting on my porch and saw a bunch of cars with signs uh, demanding justice for George Floyd, a bunch of cyclists who had been at the protest. So some of the protests sort of spilled over onto my street. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I could, I, like, I could easily hear the news choppers that were above gathering footage. I could hear the crowd chanting. I could hear them uh, moving when they started to march towards the police precinct. And so while I wasn't physically right there, I could uh, definitely feel the energy of what was happening in that corner. Yeah, yeah. Um, this has been a problem. This, I mean, this is nothing new, is it, when it comes to law enforcement in Minneapolis? And, and particularly, is it nothing new at that intersection? It, it, has there been 
historic tension between the community and police at that exact location? I mean, I think there's been just historic tension between the black community and law enforcement in Minneapolis altogether, right? Um, I think it was back in 2013, a young black man named Terrence Franklin was murdered by police and there was a lot of activism energy around that. Uh, in 2015, we had the murder of Jamar Clark at uh, like oh, in North Minneapolis, which which resulted in 18 day occupation of that police precinct, uh, the fourth precinct, and and countless others. Um, you know, there has been a lot of yep, just a lot of tension between our community and the police, and and a lot of activism calling for just calling for a different level of accountability. For right. And also just in this, uh, in this, I, I think, you know, often in Minnesota, like, people think of it as a, a liberal bastion, but we also are a place where there are, you know, M Minnesota ends up on a lot of best of lists, like, oh, it's the best place to raise kids, and it's the most literate. And what, what doesn't always get seen is that in that bestness, there's wide, wide disparities between white folks and black folks in particular, but white people and people of color in Minnesota. And, you know, you're right, talking about when people think of liber Minnesota so liberal. I mean, this cop allegedly was on stage with Trump wearing caps, make America white again. So at least as far as he's concerned in that police department, so much for super liberal uh, Hubert Humphrey, Walter Mondale, <laughs> Minnesota, huh? I mean, you know, that's that's just how it is. There's been long battles between activists and the police union, um, even just some tension between the police union and elected officials. I've, I've, I've seen a number of posts today on social media from some of my comrades about how it doesn't feel like the, it doesn't feel like this police department is actually beholden to the city in any way. They're only beholden to the union president. Yeah, yeah, it does seem that way. So tell us, um, as an activist, uh, even though you're staying confined, wisely so, um, what's next for you? What, what are you thinking about in terms of uh, supporting whatever's going on out here? I guess the, the ultimate demand will be they've been fired. And I give, for a change, uh, credit to the city leaders for doing that. You know, a lot of times we can't even get that uh, in these situations. Um, but I guess the question now is, what will happen? Do you think these officers will be charged? I mean, that remains to be seen. That totally remains to be seen. Um, our county commissioner, Angela Conley, definitely uh, has made a personal call from her office to the county attorney, Mike Freeman, and expressed her strong desire for him to, uh, to press charges to indict and prosecute these officers. Um, and so there is some activism, excuse me, there's activism energy around that, um, having having uh, the prosecutor hold them accountable through the judicial system and not, you know, I mean, we don't have, we don't have a strong track record of police ever being held accountable. Um, I wish I had the numbers in front of me, but no cop has been convicted in years and years and years. Um, and so that remains to be seen. There's also, uh, I've been following the leadership of a couple specific groups, the Black Visions Collective, and reclaim the block are two organizations that are calling for defunding of the police department. Mm -hmm. Right now, because of the COVID pandemic, the city is looking at a $60 million shortfall in the budget. And those groups, even before then, have been calling on, on the mayor and the city council to divert funds away from the police department and towards um, and toward, you know, towards things that actually do protect community health and public safety. Um, and then there's also, um, I've also just really been following the work of Unicorn Riot, which is the independent media outlet that, that brings the, the live streams and shows the stories that might not get covered on, on mainstream media. And then there's also the Minnesota Freedom Fund, which has been fighting for a long time around uh, uh, eliminating cash bail. And I think folks have been saying that they may manage some bail funds for protesters who get arrested. Erna, I'm just curious, uh, are, you, are you an abolitionist when it comes to law enforcement? Yes. Good. I am. I, I want to be. I think I am. Uh, <laughs> it's just that, you know, even for some of our people, that's, that's a heavy lift, you know, because we, we believe that we need law enforcement so much, you know. Um, 
and I know over the years and some of the 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 police accountability I've, work I've done, we made some progress and sometimes not. Um, and so one of my, I, I, to be transparent, one of my hesitations in terms of being vocally myself in favor of it is that it would then, um, I would have to remove myself from any, I think, role of continuing to negotiate or advocate or try to bring some reform. Because I would believe, as some do, and I don't fault them for believing, that this whole thing just ain't working. Um, and that their history is rooted in slave catching. I mean, that's really all there is to it. This, the police, no, there wasn't, people just wake up and say, oh, we need to fight crime. No, the original reason, as was with the Second Amendment, was to catch slaves. And a lot of people don't like to hear me say that either, that that was, the Second Amendment didn't have anything to do with tyranny or fighting back against the government. Patrick right. Henry said out loud, no, y'all, we need to keep these guns because these Africans are trying to take some of us out. Uh, 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 so, you know, I, I applaud your position and those of others in the abolitionist mu mu movement. But I think I just revealed that I am, but I just don't say it out loud, even though I just said it out loud. So I, th I think you did. <laughs> so I probably just said it. So we'll see. We'll see what the consequences are of that. But, but sister, um, you, you be safe. Um, do, do, in your community, lastly, um, I mean, we saw, we see what's happening to black women even. We saw what happened to Breonna Taylor. Yes. And for those of us who've been watching this, that was not, oh my God, it's a black woman. No, it happens to black women all the time too. Right. Be it police, armed vigilantes. In, in your community, do you um, carry yourself with a sense of not necessarily fear, but apprehension when it comes to being in your community and, and the police presence in your community at all? I mean, I think that's a complicated, that's a complicated question for me because uh, prior to working at Daily Coast, I worked for a very long time uh, as a neighborhood organizer where I did block by block organizing and interface with police on a very regular basis. And so I think it would be dishonest for me to say that I immediately go into a freeze around police officers. And it isn't because I have any natural trust of that institution. It is because I've always had, well, I don't want to say always, it is because for a long part of my career, I've had recourse. There are people uh, in the departments that I could turn to if I felt that I wasn't treated fairly, who I had personal relationship. That said, I do when I'm, it's particularly when I'm driving. Anytime a squad car is in my periphery, I get very nervous and I start to check everything. I start checking my lights. Did I signal? Do like, are my headlights on? Are my, are my tabs up to date? Is there any reason that anyone would have to stop me? That is something that makes me very nervous. Uh, when I'm alone, when I'm alone and there's police officers around and, you know, and I don't feel like I have witness that something that makes me nervous and gives me pause um, as a black person, particularly, you know, not even just particularly as a black woman, as a black person. Yeah. Uh, I'm also aware that, you know, not that this will save me at all because it won't, but I mean, I, I you know, I think people often, I can pass for middle class in ways that I wasn't raised, raised very working for and pass for middle class. And I don't think that that will save me, but I do think sometimes it gives me more confidence than I deserve. Yeah. And, you know, so every day I'm thinking about how we protect our communities and how those of us who don't feel as fearful then can step in and stand in the gap. If we feel like we have more privilege and that that we can take more risks and that we will be protected because of our standing in communities, then how do we use that? Who, how do we use that to the benefit of folks who don't feel that? Right, 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 right. You know, it, it, and you said, you know, some people get this it, it misinterpret Du Bois is talented tenth, but if you look at it carefully, that's literally what he was saying. Those of us who might have a little more privilege or experience or access to resources, we're supposed to use them uh, to help others who may not have the very recourses that you just described. That that's really what that was about. When just about you know, some folks took that to mean you know, let's be bougie, but <laughs> that wasn't the case at all. It was really about you know, not being bougie, in fact, but instead using whatever resources you had to, to serve others. Uh, before we go, I couldn't help but noticing, I noticed you posted on your Facebook 
um, it, it, tell us about this, um, if you don't mind. You wrote, uh, um, just rehearsed how to talk about police murder with a six-year-old. Um, what, what was that? What, what happened? So my partner has a six-year-old nephew that she has actually been more of a co-parent to than an, an auntie. And right now, because of COVID, uh, they don't spend physical time together. You know, they get to talk and do video chats. And in her co-parenting relationship with her with her sibling, she's often been the person who handles some of the tougher conversations. And so what happened was her sister was, like the rest of us, just hurt and enra enraged and outraged about what was happening. And, and probably expressing that in a way that her child could overhear and so and so we called her and asked you know what's the conversation that you're having with this child about what's going on um does he understand do you feel equipped to talk to him about this in, in any other way um because if not that's something that we can take on well not even we that's something that my partner was willing to take on is to be the parent to have that conversation and so she and i together uh just kind of rehearsed it and, and, and went through what it made sense to talk about what felt age appropriate. Um, how, how do we be really honest without, how do we be honest and put caution into this child, but not fear of movement? You know, because I, th I think sometimes as, as black adults, we get so fearful around our children that we're afraid for them to have joy and have fun and move freely about parks and public spaces. And so, like how do how what's the conversation that she could have with him that would give him an age appropriate sense of the gravity of what's happening, but also not overwhelm him too much. And so we talked it through and, you know, added things and took away things. And yeah, I yeah, that was it was really heavy. And afterwards we cried about it because we're also talking about a kid who's very, very spirited and mm -hmm. who who we want to have that kind of spirit, but also know that as a young black kid who uh, is sometimes defiant, just as he's trying to come into his own self, he's sometimes very defiant. Um, you know, there's a fear for his safety, but also how do you balance that fear with his safety without wanting to just take away his youth? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the struggle for all parents, biological or not, for all the black adults when it comes to to our children. Erna, you continue to be safe and careful. Uh, it's a pleasure to chat with you and meet you. I, I hope we can stay in touch. We thank you for joining us uh, as um, um, a, a special. Well, you're not a guest, you're, you're part of Coast, so it's Thursday Coast. And uh, mm -hmm. we do this every week, so we'll definitely have you back. Um, I can, can see, uh, well, I've been made aware of your activism. Uh, and your revolutionary spirit, I can see it, hear it, and feel it. So um, I'm thankful that you're there um, as a representative of that community. And I'm thankful that you're going to continue to do the work that you've been doing and, and make that difference. So uh, we thank you, sister, for joining us, OK? I uh, thank you so much. And thank you for just thank you for uplifting what's happening in Minneapolis so, so the rest of the world can pay attention. Absolutely, absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, it is hard and painful to believe that in just a 24 hour period, we have learned of not only George Floyd's death, but also what happened in Central Park in the Ramble with another Karen phone call. And then the woman who killed her nine year old autistic baby and blamed his death on two black men or his kidnapping abduction on two black men, which never happened. It's not enough that we are disproportionately being impacted by COVID, but it got to kill us too. Got to call the police on us too. That's, that's just too much. I was early today on the, on the prayer call, the Proctor Conference prayer call, which we have every morning. And we stream it on social media if you've not seen it. I, I couldn't help but think of the words of Marvin Gaye. And he was talking about war. 
and the war in Vietnam, but the war applies to us. You know? Mother, mother, there's too many of you crying. Brother, 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 there's far too many of you dying at the hands of police and vigilantes. Lord, please help us find a way to bring some love for our people here today. Father, Father, we don't need to escalate. You see, war on our people's not the answer, for only love for our people can stop and conquer hate. The hate that the police exhibit when killing us, the hate that Karens exhibit when they call the police on us in dog parks for no reason, the hate that mothers in Florida, Patricia specifically in Florida, exhibited when she blamed her child's death on black men. Lord, please help us find a way to bring some love for our people here today. If you love us, you love yourself, because we're the same. There's really no difference. It's a human race. We're all one race. Somebody just decided that we were different. We can't breathe, Lord. Lord, we need you to help us breathe. We're going to continue to try to breathe for George Floyd and for Eric Garner, but we can't breathe, Lord. We've been having trouble breathing even before we had to wear these masks. This nation is not only affected with corona, but it's infected with com complicity and complacency toward racism and white supremacy. Help us to breathe, Lord. Help us to breathe. If all minds are clear, it has been made plain. Thank you for listening to Make It Plain and Get Woke. Remember to listen, like, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. If all minds are clear, it has been made plain.